Have you come across a strange complaint like this? The face puffing up like a balloon while enjoying a meal and then getting back to normal after the meal is done? This is due to the condition of sialolithiasis. As captivating as it sounds, sialolithiasis can be quite uncomfortable for patients. First, we need to understand the culprits themselves, sialoliths or salivary stones. These are calcified structures that form inside the duct or the salivary gland itself. When present, they block the flow of saliva, causing a backup of saliva in the duct and gland. Sialoliths are made up of organic and inorganic materials. The inorganic materials include minerals like hydroxyapatite, calcium carbonates, and phosphates. The organic materials include glycoproteins, cell debris, bacteria, and mucopolysaccharides. Sialoliths can form due to several factors that either favor saliva retention or alter its composition. Factors that influence salivary flow are irregularities in the salivary ducts. Inflammation in the salivary duct causes neutrophils to rush into the duct. These then attract calcium-based crystals like hydroxyapatite, bruchite, and whitlockite, which contribute to sialolith formation. Not drinking enough fluids can thicken saliva and slow down its flow. Certain medications like anticholinergics and diuretics can decrease saliva flow as a side effect. Factors that alter salivary composition are high calcium levels can form sialolith crystals more easily and low phytate levels. Phytate in saliva helps prevent the formation of hydroxyapatite crystals. When phytate levels are low, the risk of sialolith increases. Pop quiz. Salivary calculi are more commonly seen in the submandibular gland than the parotid gland. Let us understand why this is so. The submandibular duct drains saliva against gravity as the gland is situated lower than the ductal orifice, which contributes to the stagnation of saliva. This also makes it harder for the saliva to flow out. Another factor is that the opening of Wharton duct is narrower than that of Stenson's duct creating a potential bottleneck path for the saliva. The next factor is that the submandibular gland produces mainly mucinous saliva, which is thicker than the serous saliva from the parotid gland. This thicker saliva flows less easily and is more prone to stagnation. The next reason is that the submandibular gland secretes more alkaline saliva. This alkaline environment makes it easier for minerals like calcium and phosphate to form crystals which eventually become sialoliths. Finally, the tortuous course of Wharton duct has two sharp bends, one near the mylohyoid muscle and another close to the opening in the mouth. These bends can further trap saliva and debris causing sialolith formation. Let us now discuss the clinical features of sialolithiasis. Sialolithiasis can be tricky to diagnose clinically because some people with stones don't experience any symptoms. Symptoms only appear if the stone blocks the salivary duct. These include swelling of the gland and acute onset of pain that worsens with meals. If blocked saliva leads to infection, the skin over the swollen gland may become erythematous and warm to the touch. Such patients present with fever and malaise. Pain and swelling during meals occur because mastication stimulates salivary production. A block in the duct due to a sialolith leads to salivary pooling within the duct leading to expansion. Since the gland is surrounded by a thick capsule, the gland has limited space to expand causing pain. If the blockage is partial, some saliva might still squeeze through, allowing the swelling to gradually go down after eating. However, a complete blockage traps all the saliva, leading to persistent swelling. 
At times, pus may drain from the duct along with inflammation of the ductal opening. The swollen gland is often tender on palpation. In chronic cases, complications like fistula, sinus tract, or even ulceration can occur in the tissue around the stone. Moving on to imaging modalities that help in identifying the presence and location of a sialolith. These are conventional radiographs, sialography, ultrasonography, CBCT, computed tomography, and sialendoscopy. Let us briefly discuss them, beginning with conventional radiographs. These are inexpensive, readily available, and result in minimal radiation exposure. Occlusal views are useful for detecting submandibular sialolithiasis. A rotated posterior anterior view may be useful to identify parotid gland sialolith, but they are less reliable. Only about 80% of sialoliths are visible on these radiographs because some of them lack the density required to appear radio-opaque. This means they can be missed using this method alone. Next is conventional sialography using panoramic, occlusal and periapical radiographs. This is traditionally regarded as the gold standard for diagnosing sialolithiasis as it allows excellent visualization of the salivary ducts and underlying ductal abnormalities. Contrast silography using iodinated contrast media may be used to visualize the parotid and submandibular ductal systems. In this technique, a contrast dye is injected via a small needle, enabling radiographic visualization of the ducts and sialoliths. Although sialoliths appear radioopaque, at times they give a radiolucent appearance if they are not calcified enough. The contrast dye can also act as a silagogue, stimulating salivary production. This allows smaller sialolids to dislodge and pass. Disadvantages include radiation exposure and the risk of allergic reaction to the dye. Moving on to ultrasonography. It is a non-invasive method of imaging silolithiasis. It is less expensive than most other imaging modalities. Other benefits include no radiation exposure real-time image interpretation, and widespread availability. However, ultrasound may not be able to show the exact number of sialoliths present and those smaller than 2 mm. To overcome this, we have computed tomography to identify small calculi, but at the expense of high radiation exposure. The next imaging technique is CBCT imaging with sialography. CBCT imaging offers a 3D view, reducing the overlapping of structures and providing a more accurate image than traditional two-dimensional radiographs. Compared to CT scans, CBCT uses significantly less radiation exposure. Finally, we have siloendoscopy, which uses a tiny camera to provide a direct magnified view of the salivary ducts and any siloliths present. This allows for highly accurate diagnosis. In addition to the diagnosis of sialolithiasis, sialendoscopy is increasingly being used for treatment as well. Compared to traditional open surgery, siloendoscopy is a safe and minimally invasive procedure. Moving on to the management of sialolithiasis. For a symptomatic patient, the treatment is primarily supportive. It includes moist heat application, analgesics, antibiotics such as amoxicillin, typically taken at 500 mg three times a day for six days, and drinking of at least 1.5 liters of water per day. If conservative measures don't work or the stone is large, there are several ways to remove it such as milking the gland, sialoendoscopy, extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, and surgery. For small, easily accessible stones near the duct opening, a technique called milking can sometimes dislodge the stone. This involves gently massaging the gland to express saliva and hopefully push out the stone. Sialendoscopy is preferred for removal of smaller stones up to 4 to 5 mm in diameter. ESWL or extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy involves focusing shock waves on the stone to break it into smaller fragments. These can then pass naturally with saliva flow or be removed with silendoscopy. 
This is an option for larger stones. In rare cases of very large stones, conventional surgery like superficial paradectomy or transcervical submandibulectomy may be necessary. Post-operative complications associated with paradectomy include transient or permanent facial nerve injury and sensory loss of greater auricular nerve. Risks associated with submandibular gland removal include temporary or permanent injury to the marginal mandibular nerve, temporary or permanent hypoglossal nerve palsy, and permanent lingual nerve damage. Sialolithiasis is a very treatable condition. Fortunately, there are several effective treatment options available, ranging from simple supportive care to minimally invasive procedures. In most cases, with early diagnosis and intervention, the prognosis is excellent. We have now come to the end of this video. Hope you had fun learning with us.